Hello, my name is Nathan Schohoff, and I'm known as the inventor of the MP3 player. And I want to welcome you to Awaken Nation with Brad Solace. A huge shift is taking place on planet Earth. People seem to be waking up. Tired of the way things used to be, they are creating something brand new and changing the world we live in. My name is Brad Zalas, and I get to sit down with the next generation of idea makers, the disruptors, and the game changers. Everyday people, just like you and me, from all over, who are doing amazing things. Welcome to Awakened Nation. Well, my friend, I am super honored to have you on the show. We've had some inventors on as well. Marty Cooper was on, uh, the guy who uh, invented the uh, cordless phone. Uh, he was quite mm -hmm. a character. And uh, I wanted to talk about all your inventions and stuff and give a shout out and a homage to Denise Griffiths, who's a very good friend of mine, and um, talk about your career because uh, it's, it's, you know what it is? It's, um, and we'll talk about this. You get known for one thing, but I'm sure your other inventions have had a bigger impact. Uh, am I correct? Is that possible? Well, they had big impacts, but and I'm very proud of them. But nothing as big as the MP3 player. I mean, I okay. I did well on other things. I, you know, I was involved with early Apple products, right? But uh, the MP3 player changed my life. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the the guy who brought you into the modern world. <laughs> Nathan Schulhoff is on the show today. And uh, Nathan, I just want to welcome you to Awakened Nation, my friend. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. You bet. We're going to take a deep dive into your career. And uh, I'm just going to read your bio real quick. Uh, Nathan Schulhoff has been a visionary from the beginning of the technology era, bringing new and innovative devices and technologies to our world, such as the MP3 player, which he holds five patents for and many other technologies that have changed our world. And uh, I'm very ex excited to have you on Awakened Nation today because you have this amazing uh, relationship with Apple, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, because other people, you know, you presented the MP3 to them and they were sort of like, oh, OK. But you've researched and worked with green energy and futuristic technologies. And I want to talk about that. Uh, disruptive technologies. Uh, I mean, everything. You are um, an inventor that I have to say you bring actual things that we need into production. And I appreciate that. So thank you for being on the show today, Nathan. Why, thank you. Mm hmm. So let me ask you this, and I know you've been doing this a long, long time. Please tell us how, not only how you got started, but when you finally started inventing and, and presenting the MP3, um, you got a lot of a resistance. So I know that's a lot to pack in, but let's start off with the, the big question. On how I invented the MP3 player? Yeah, how you, got, how, how you got us here into the modern world. Well... It actually started a long, long time ago, and I, I wasn't technical. I learned to be technical over the years. Mm -hmm. I heard about this little company that nobody has ever heard of before mm -hmm. called Apple Computer. So you know it was a long time ago. Yes. Uh, they weren't a trillion-dollar company back then. They were barely a thousand-dollar company. Right. And... Uh, my brother came back and he showed me, I have a younger brother who's a lot younger than me. And he showed me this Apple computer. Back then it was an Apple one. And he said, wow. this is going to be the future. And I, he showed it to me and I thought, yeah, this is going to be the future. And eventually the Apple II came out and I became uh, a third party developer for Apple computer. And I developed a word processor, which back then most people, unless you were a lawyer, didn't know what a word processor even was. Computers weren't in homes. Tape, uh, tape recorders loaded the uh, content into the computer wow. because disk drives came a bit later, and they were the large 8-inch floppy disks. Wow. So uh, I developed a word processor, which became a bestseller over the years, and it was called Word Handler, and uh, that changed my life. Then from that on, I gotten to many other innovative products, which led me to the MP3 player. 
which was actually one of the hardest visions I tried to sell. Uh, you know, the first four years of development, we had no venture capital money, no institutional money. I used to go around and get interesting angels, and the angels are wealthy individuals, just normal people that have been able to accumulate some money and make investments. The first four or five years of working on the MP3 player, I raised approximately $8 million from about 50, 60 wealthy angels because I could not sell the vision. I had a, I had a CEO of a very well-known, large, multi-billion dollar company in my office who was a personal friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, and I don't want to mention his name, but I said to him, this is going to be big. And I, I'd like you to be involved with it. Uh, maybe you would like to be president of the company and I'll, I'll work with you. He, he was a, he's a household name and it's no one from Apple. Uh, and he looked at it. Actually, he flew in on his large aircraft, personal aircraft. Uh, and uh, after a whole presentation, he said to me, you know, Nathan, I think you have something here, but I think it's going to be a very small niche. I don't ever think it's going to be really that big. And I, I don't think it's something that I would be involved with. And uh, I, I think I've never thrown it up to him because I, I'm, we're still friends. Uh, I've never mentioned it to him, but he probably put it in the back of his mind. Anyways. Wow. It's amazing how people kind of miss the bus, you know, because um, let's go back in time a little bit. I'll explain to some people this. They may not know this, but Apple computers originally started almost like a Heath kit. You ordered your computer and you put it together just like a ham radio. And those first computers had a wooden top and they had their logo on it, which was Sir Isaac Newton under a, a tree getting hit on the head with an apple, you know, apple. Um, and so when they transitioned to actually compete with IBM, um, then they became like a real computer company. And you're right in the middle of all this, which I find exciting because it's almost like the wild, wild west. And you said it best. There weren't a bunch of venture capitalists running up and banging on everyone's doors because the computer industry was so new that people didn't think it would be a stable business sector. They really didn't. And you can see this in the original Karate Kid. At the beginning of the movie, they're driving to California, and the mother um, tells her son, you know, uh, what's his name? He he looks at her and goes, "Mom, why aren't why aren't, aren't we going to Seattle?" And she goes, "Oh no, the computer industry is too unstable. I got a job <laughs> at a restaurant as as the the greeter." And and you look back on that today, and your jaw drops. Like. How could people not see this was a golden opportunity? And um, you're right. I mean, I, I was a child. Of, I was born in the early 60s. And as the 70s came up, I mean, I watched us go from uh, reel to reel to eight track tapes in my car to cassette tapes to CDs, you know, and, and disc players and all this. The, the technology just incredibly quickly converged and became our ubiquitous way of dealing with life. And so um, I'm helping people catch up with this because we, we do have some young listeners and viewers of my show and they all remember the day that CompuServe disc came in the mail <laughs> or the AOL disc came in the mail. But we're talking about way before that, folks. <laughs> way before that. <laughs> so let's keep going. So you're you're running around trying to sell this idea, this, this crazy idea of the MP3 player. And um, what made you get to Apple? You know, besides well, you know, besides you know, really, you're already I, developing I, stuff. I really never got to Apple. We came out with the very first MP3 player in 1996. We filed our patents in 1994. Mm -hmm. In 1996, we introduced a product called the Listen Up Player. Wow. which was the very first MP3 player. Actually, we spoke about Pittsburgh. It's in the yeah. uh, Heinz History Museum. Oh, uh, wow. There's a display with the original one in it today, and, and, and uh, which is a division of the Smithsonian Institute. Yeah. Uh, Apple. Apple came out with it years later, and uh, it was just another product. 
they were amongst of several other companies that also introduced them. There was MP3 Man, there was a lot of them. But Apple was the first company that really commercialized it. When, yeah. You know, when they when they launched iTunes and and created license agreements with all the major record labels, and they had the bandwidth at that time to do it. Yeah. Uh, it, it simplified the process because people didn't want to use code or have to be a, an engineer to get music. They wanted right. to, like, turn on a TV, press a button, turn on knobs, as Apple did it with the original Macintosh the, and the iPhone, you know. Apple is a fantastic company, uh, and they're really visionaries where, where, uh, where they see how, how something can be used, and they make it easy and simplistic. Yeah, I agree. My thing is, is uh, and I am ashamed to admit this, <laughs> uh, I was part of the dot-com boom of the nineties. I had a little company that went public and, you know, we, we designed websites, those very first wave of websites. And I have to be honest with you, I'm a huge Star Trek fan, but oh my goodness, do I resist technology and change because my business partner came in and he goes, we have to become an internet digital firm. And I'm like, what is the internet? You know, <laughs> it's 1995 or 94. I had no idea what it was. And I feel like you were at the cutting edge of where people didn't really understand convergence of technology and moving out of analog into digital. Uh, now I understand everything. You know, I can I can talk to people about it. Uh, but the the reality is is this was the cusp or the crest of a wave that we didn't see coming. Most of us didn't and didn't understand the magnitude of how this would spread all over the world so quickly. Um, and I'll give you a case in point, the electric grid, you, you know, invented by Tesla and promoted by, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Mr. Edison, uh, took 100 years to permeate around the world and become a ubiquitous part of our lives. Whereas the computer age took 25 years. It was the fastest growth I've ever seen of a technology ever in my life, maybe except automobiles. Um, it just exploded, it seemed like. And you're right in the middle of all this. Did you ever realize how big this was going to get? I did. I, I did. Uh, <laughs> my, my biggest thing is I've been a visionary. And it's hard mm. to be a visionary because other people don't see the same vision. And right. people don't like change. Um, you know, I've been an entrepreneur pretty much all my life. And I think Reid Hoffman, who was the founder of LinkedIn, has a quote that I always love. He says, being an entrepreneur is like jumping off a cliff and building an airplane on the way down. And that's what it's like. You know, it's, so, it's true. It's very true. If you remember, CDs originally were for music and they weren't on computers. You know, right. uh, I purchased a company in 1992 and this company had a technology, which is very common today. You know how you can try a piece of software five or six times and it works and you create data files. Then afterwards, you either have to buy it or it locks up and you can't use it anymore. Right. Well, this company, we created, I, I purchased this technology of, we used to call it Try Before You Buy. And the name of the company was called Test Drive. And it had several patents and we bought the technology. And this was a new Try Before You Buy back then. And back then, everything was on floppy disks. They started oh, yeah. out with eight inch, and then they went to the five and a quarter, then they were the three and a half inch. And 10 megabyte drives sold for like, a thousand dollars back. Uh, yeah. Then. Yeah. Okay. So, and they were external. So CDs were only really popular with music, but on the, on these, on these floppy disks, they would hold like 10 megabytes, eight megabytes of storage, which is nothing on a program today. Uh, so CDs would hold over 500 megabytes. This was amazing. And they were selling 
CD players for computers, but they were, again, $1,000, and they were external. They were an external device. So we formed this company called Test Drive, and we became the largest buyer of CDs for computer in the world. What we did is we went around to all the major software manufacturers, Microsoft, which Lotus back then, right? Uh, Visicalc, if you can remember that. You know, <laughs> all of the all the main players, Borland International, which was a large player back then, and we had about fifty to a hundred different software companies that paid us to be on our CD, and. Users who used that CD could try a piece of software five times or 10 times, whatever the manufacturer wanted. And then they could call our number because there was no interactive internet at the time. And they could purchase it over the phone. And we had an unlocking code that would unlock it. Well, it, it, it was a huge success. We cut, we cut a, a, an agreement with PC Magazine and PC World where you remember CDs were featured in magazines that would give them away yes. in a magazine. Yeah. We were the first to do that. Okay. I, I wow. thought of that concept. I went to PC world, PC magazine. And I said, look, you can offer something different. You can de you can give this away. Have people have access to 50 or hundred pieces of software on this try before you buy. It'll give you something different, increase your circulation and it'll help us. And they liked the idea. So we did it. It, it was a great success. Uh, our phones rang off the hook. And within 14 months, we sold that company to R.R. Donnelly and Sons. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're out of Chicago. Yes, okay. I remember them. Yeah, they're still around. They've been around since the 1800s and you know, uh, I, I stayed on for a year as a CEO, but, you know, guys like me scare them and guys yes. like them scare me. They're not used to visionary entrepreneurs. They're, yeah. they're a very, very conservative company. Yeah. So they wanted the technology for distribution in their printing areas and things. So uh, our shareholders did well. We did well. But that was a lead. That was, you know, yeah. just a CD was a vision. Something, another story that I love to tell. When we were doing the MP3 player, our creative director is a man named Ted Richards. And Ted was quite the visionary from a creative point. And we used to meet on weekly company meetings. And we discussed while we were developing the first MP3 player. And he was doing the, the background, the, the computer uh, uh interface of how you're going to do all of this. And he right. said, you know, I have a problem. I'm trying to think of how, how do people take the content that they want and download it to the picket, select it and download it to the, the MP3 player, to the device. So he, he said, you know, I really have a problem. I want to make it simple. So yeah. after a couple of weeks, he came in one day with a big smile. He was happy. He said, I figured it out. What I'm going to do is create something called a shopping cart, just like you do in a supermarket. And he said, people go, will go through, and when they sample a piece of content that they want, they can take it, they can put it in their shopping cart. Then when the shopping cart fills up, they can take it and download it to the device, to the MP3 wow. player. And <laughs> that was the first shopping cart. But we were focused on the MP3 player. We never patented it. We never copyrighted it. We, we, we didn't protect it. Uh, and today, that is how the shopping cart was invented. Wow. You are taking me down memory lane, man. Because <laughs> uh, my company was involved in uh, you know designing the interface and the coding in the background for a lot of this stuff. And I think it was about five or six years ago before I moved to Las Vegas. I had lived in New York City for 35 years. And you're going to laugh at this because you are describing the history of all this. I threw out, you, you're, you're going to laugh. I had a SideQuest drive and eat uh, oh, the yeah. five and a half to inch one. And then it kept getting smaller. And then they, they lost the company somehow. Nobody was interested in those micro discs. I 
had every daisy chain imaginable. And the fact that I'm saying daisy chain dates me already. And then the master <laughs> plug at the end of the daisy chain, you couldn't have a cable more than two and a half feet long. I mean, the, the, if you're if you're a Gen Xer or a, a, let's say a millennial, you're probably sitting here going, you know, what? <laughs> you know, the, the speed at which everything came and the amount of junk we had to buy and then it was upgraded and changed and I remember when getting an 80 megabyte motherboard of RAM, you know, that little board you got and it had to click inside, mm -hmm. that was $1,600. And within less than five years, it dropped to 80 bucks, I think, or 120. That same $1,600 piece of, you know, RAM chip dropped down to like 80 bucks. And I, I just couldn't believe it. It was like everything dropped in price. I remember when... Um, there was uh, Silicon Graphics, the company. Mm -hmm. I went. I used to go to the uh, the uh, multimedia congress every year. They had this amazing workstation, and they were showing us clips from Jurassic Park. They were the first animated computer company to do the special effects for Jurassic Park. And I remember their basic workstation was two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and you're going to laugh at this when they showed us that they could render in real time. In other words, before that they would make a skeleton structure of the shape of the animal. And then they would hit save render after they figured out the movement and everything hours, thousands of hours for this, then they would hit render and it would take months to render, <laughs> you know, you could go on vacation. Well, when they showed that they could spin the dinosaurs around in real time, you should have heard the audience just go, what? You know, I mean, people went crazy. And I now remember. We, and now we look at that and we're just like, you know, Silicon Graphics, I think, is out of business or got bought out. And now we look at that and even your basic special effects package uh, is available to a regular person now. Like they can buy RenderMan. Um, they can use it. Uh, but uh, my hat's off to you, Nathan. You are a pioneer uh, of getting it done because what an entrepreneur does is looks for holes in the system or needs. Or, and sometimes it's the most simplistic thing to have a direct mail piece inserted into a magazine in, the, in a slot is genius today. We look back at that and it's genius, but the reality is, is you needed to do that. Am I right? We needed to do that. You look for the tools that you have today. Like you said, you can you can buy these programs off the shelf that makes this happen. But back then, everything had to be programmed with machine assembly or C or uh, a, a type of computer language. It was a massive job. And yeah. uh, there's yeah. always growth. People say people think that there's nowhere else they can go from today. The future yeah. is always miraculous and it's going to continue to be that way. Yeah. I love the fact that you, you're a tech entrepreneur and sometimes your solutions are as simple as can possibly be. And that's what it is sometimes. Uh, understanding how the development of an MP4 video also is, is just fascinating to me. You know, when I first saw a QuickTime player in our office back in the, the nineties, there was the space shuttle landing. That was the first movie that came out. Um, I was like, as a graphic designer, I was really upset that this seemed to be going backwards because, you know, files were supposed to get bigger and sharper and crisper. And now we're working in 72 DPI with 64 bit color. <laughs> I was just like, it was frustrated. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it took me a while to understand this. You're going to laugh because I'm so uh, resistant sometimes. I, I smack myself in the back of the head. Uh, I started to realize it was much more than that. And I think when I wrote my first book, Liquid Leadership, um, the, the book, The Clue Train Manifesto, was sort of the slap in the face, the ice cold water <laughs> right in my face <laughs> that made me go, oh, that's what the internet is. It's communication, it's broadcasting, it's receiving, it's a marketplace. It's so many things that I couldn't see in the beginning. And I think that's what kind of holds people back from seeing the future. It's like, what is the possibility from here and then the next 25 years? Um, is there a process that you use to like 
predict the future. Let's let's just say it. You're predicting the future. No, it's just a love hate relationship. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> fun and it's painful. Uh, you know, I I uh, I I go to sleep seeing the future. You know, yeah. there will be cell phones that you charge once a year. Nice. Uh, that's in our future. I'm looking forward to that. We're going to need that. <laughs> yes. I love it. I charge my cell phone usually three or four times a day. You know, I've gotten good at knowing that if I get up and I'm on the phone early, I need to charge it by noon if I'm going to keep a charge all day. <laughs> Otherwise, forget it. So I have nothing but Apple products. And my girlfriend, uh, she uses Android and PC. So you're probably thinking, how can a interracial relationship like this work? <laughs> but <laughs> oh, well. it does. She's constantly complaining about uh, Mac, you know, because she does a lot of my tech work. And I just look at her and go, why you got to be a hater? You know, it's like hating, <laughs> it's like hating uh, you know, having a Porsche, you know, of course. It, it's a beautiful device. Maybe it doesn't have everything that you think it should have, but... Uh, can't be a hater in this house. <laughs> I've I've been a uh, consultant for Apple from, from 1980 to the late 2000s. I was actually uh, I was involved in their patent department, and I was a consultant on their uh, Apple versus Samsung lawsuit, that big lawsuit, uh, yeah. which was a which was a blast. Uh, I got to work with some of the largest law firms in the country, and I love Apple, but I'm yeah. an Android guy too. <laughs> Traitor! <laughs> hey, uh, have you met uh, Steve Jobs or, or uh, any? Oh, of many those? times. Oh, how about Wozniak? He, he the big Woz. I, I, I know him. I've met him. Uh, actually, he he spoke at campus party at the same time I did on a few times. Uh, yeah. Last time, I think 2014. I don't know him well. I knew Jobs a lot better, but. Uh, I used to go to all the Apple meetings and yeah. uh, even got to meet Bill Gates a couple of times. Oh, wow. Well, I got to tell you, uh, this is a refreshing conversation. And I do have to give a big shout out to our mutual friend, Denise Griffiths, for introducing us. Um, her her podcast, Your Partner in Success, is a fantastic show and it's been on for quite a while. Um, and I enjoyed your interview with her. Isn't she something? You know, I agree. She makes you feel so comfortable. She's a fantastic uh, uh, podcast host. She's really, really something. I've, I've done several of these over the years, and I was probably more impressed with the way Denise runs her show uh, more so than most. Uh, yeah. She does a great job. She's a fantastic host and a good friend as well. She's um, uh, given me advice on a lot of issues through the years. Uh, she's a very spiritual person too. Um, but her style, uh, you know, I feel honored to maybe have picked up a little bit of her style. It's more of a conversation and she really does her research. That's the, the best part about all this. Um, that's what I love about her. So big shout out to you, Denise, if you're listening. We love you. <laughs> yeah, we sure do, Denise. Uh, you know, she's a, she, when you when you're doing her show. First of all, she has some very interesting guests. Yeah, and her mm -hmm. shows are always quite interesting and informative. But you know, when you're uh, a guest on her show, you feel like you're sitting there talking to a friend. She's uh, it's one of the most comfortable shows I've ever done. Oh, good. Um, I'm going to get back into this groove here. You, I watched one of your keynote speeches, and I think it was with some students in Spanish, and you told them to follow their passion. And I love that. Um, and th is that what you do? You just follow what you love to do? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, um, when I say it's a love-hate relationship, you know, people think like, oh, the MP3 player, you're lucky you thought of that. I got to tell you, that was one of the most painful companies that I've ever done. I mean, it's not easy. I used to go to sleep every night thinking, how am I going to make payroll on Thursday? And this would be on oh. a Tuesday. And I had, you know, $30,000 in the bank and a $500,000 payroll in three days. Yeah. Uh, and I, I never missed the payroll. Uh, 
but it, it's painful. It's uh, asking people to take a new concept or something new is not easy. No. But also, on the other hand, it's the most fun I've ever had. I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't change it for the world. It I is. had the experience of going public, which on, on the Nasdaq, which was another fantastic experience. Yeah, I, I, I got to tell you what it was like. You know, Please. I tell you these days, I couldn't make payroll. I'd always worry about money in the bank to keep the company going because we were a development company. Right. I mean, every single payroll, just about. I had a struggle to make it or to pay the rent or to pay the, the bills. Then all of a sudden, in 1998, we went public. Wow. And we had tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars in the bank. And I, I took a deep breath and I thought, God, my life has changed. And I don't mean to go out and buy toys or things. I mean, we can survive. We can go to the next vision, to the next idea without that stress. Yeah. And you know how when you when you call up Bank of America or your bank to check your balance, you get a recording after typing the numbers. It says your balance is eighty nine dollars and thirty three cents. You know, it's a recording, right? Yeah. So what I did right before our CFO transferred the money to mutual funds and everything, it was sitting in our checking account because that's where the underwriter wires it. Right. I, I called up Bank of America, which was our bank. I played that recording, and I got your balance is one hundred one million three hundred eighty three dollars and seventy two cents. Okay, I recorded that, and I <laughs> went around to to all our employees. I said, "We'll never be poor again." Nice. <laughs> I played that nice. recording, uh, and it wasn't for bragging. It was no, just no. that you know we have gasoline in our tank. People see yeah. our vision. It was yes. a good feeling. So uh, if I could pick any profession ever to be looking back, I still would be an entrepreneur. And uh, being a visionary was one of the best blessings I've ever had. Yeah, I would agree with you. Uh, this is the one thing you and I have in common. I took my company public in 1996 on NASDAQ. Uh, in New York City, July 26, 1996. I remember it to this day. And the struggle to make payroll is uh, um, any any real <laughs> entrepreneur. Yeah, you're laughing. You know. I had a buddy of mine on the show a few months ago, Bruce Lipman. And uh, we're going way back. He had me on a panel back uh, at his, uh, he had the, he has this group meeting, this membership group meeting for accountants and lawyers. And he put me on stage with three other consultants who were heavy hitters. You know, they were accountants, lawyers, and all this. And I'm sitting there, you know, I'm, I'm a graphic designer, creative director. I've worked with some of the top brands in the world. And I'm sitting there, I go, Bruce, why do you have me on this panel? And he goes, Brad, because you've bled. You've bled in the streets. You've bit your fingernails on a Thursday night trying to figure out how to make payroll. And I just, I burst out laughing, you know, because he has that that Boston accent. And, and he's just telling me right to my face, he's a little guy. So he's pointing up at me. And so I'm like laughing. I go, okay, now I understand. And um, I think it's a mutual uh, love affair amongst uh, entrepreneurs. You know, to if you truly are an entrepreneur, you're not just creating a job for yourself. You're creating jobs for other people with this amazing vision of a product or a service that you truly feel passionate about. And so when it gets to that level, I totally understand you now have breathing room. You oh, now, totally. you, you now, you know, instead those 95 hour work weeks you do to make up for not having staff to, to cover certain things. Now, you know, you're right. You have gasoline in the tank. So, uh, my hat's off to you, brother. Which, which company was that, by the way, that went public? Audio Highway. Nice. AudioHighway.com. The MP3 player. Oh, uh, yeah. Do, do we have time for a short story on uh, please. raising the money? Yes, okay. please. I want to hear it. Oh, it all started, uh, I went from institution to an institution. I hired an investment banking firm to get me institutional money. I had no success. 
all my money was coming from angels. Yeah. I uh, went from venture capital firm to venture capital firm. And every time at the end of the meeting, they seemed to sound very interested where I thought, oh, I'm going to get a deal here. And they say, I'll call you on Monday. Well, Monday, no, no calls. They wouldn't even take my call. So, you know, they couldn't see the vision of digital music or so. Finally, I I get a call from the venture capital company says there's a second or third tier fund in San Francisco, which that's the area we were in. He said he he would be he'd like to have a meeting with you. So we go into his office. I took my CFO, the head of engineering, so so we could explain what we're doing. I gave my presentation and all through it, he, he kept on and he kept interrupting me, telling me about the deal he was currently working on. And what it was, was dog water. Yeah. This guy was coming <laughs> up, bottled water for dogs. And I'm thinking, I am sitting with this guy telling him about digital music and how we're going to change the world of music and eliminate the, the Sony Walkman for something much, much better. And this guy is telling me, uh, bragging to me about dog water. I know. So, you know, I gave him my whole presentation, which was getting nowhere. And I was just thoroughly disgusted. He wouldn't get off of this dog water. So I'm getting ready to leave. He says, one thing more about dog water. He said, when we're done with dogs, there's cats. Oh, my God. Okay. And obviously, I didn't get any money from him. And a year later, we went public, raised a ton of money on a first and second offering. Uh, the last day of December, we were the last offering of the year in 1998. Wow. That's awesome. Um, I think it was December 19th of 1998. Nice. Yeah. So going public, I mean, uh, I might've waited longer back in the day. That was my only regret because we went public probably two months before all the communicad, you know, companies went public and all the you know, the big internet explosion that took place. Um, But my CEO really wanted to be the first to do this. So that's why we we went public so early. But I love this story simply because did did you ever meet with that third tier venture capitalist ever again about dog water? No, I I never wanted to see him again. But, you know, Uh, right after we went public, we had a bunch of money in the bank and we did the first major cybercast Oh, wow. Uh, ever in the world. We, we rented Dodger Stadium. Uh, we partnered with Clear's Channel to help us produce it. We had Britney Spears, Will Smith, 98 Degrees, Blondie, uh, uh, many others. And we did an all-day concert. And we wow. broadcast it over phone lines. Okay? There, people didn't I have heard. broadband. But back over, then, it was we, 56K. Yeah. And Entertainment Tonight, the TV show, covered it. I have actually a 49-second video on it. If you like, I'd be glad to send it to you. I would love to see that. You're going to laugh. You're going to laugh at this. We did uh, the first broadcast. uh, We did the Gary Kasparov uh, versus Deep Blue, uh, the chess challenge, the IBM chess challenge. We were hired by Ogilvy Mather to do the live broadcast down in Philadelphia. And because it was being covered by the New York Times and there was no streaming at the time, we had to imitate streaming with GIFs. And on top of that, we, you're going to laugh at this, we had to get people who understood chess. So we hired a room full of Russian programmers. And Nick Koploff was one of our, our first employees from Russia. And he spoke perfect English with that thick Russian accent. So he commanded all these guys. And so they knew chess like we know baseball. And you'd sit there and go, why did that guy make that move? He goes, that is the Bulgarian move. It is classic. <laughs> classic. It is, uh, he is a brilliant man. It's so brilliant. But I have to tell you this story. I came back from my honeymoon after they had uh, hired these guys. So it's like a week later. I come in the office and my business partner, Doug, goes, Hey, have you met the programmers yet? I go, no. He goes, watch. I go, what? What do you what do you mean? He goes, just watch. Come. I walk in the room 
and I guess Nick says something in Russian, this is the other owner. They stood up and snapped that attention <laughs> like like we were commanders on a battleship. And I said, whoa, 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 guys, you're in America. You can sit down now. <laughs> and I turned around to all the other employees and I go, but I do like this. I, I really think the rest <laughs> of you should adopt this. We all started laughing. But um, I asked Nick later, I said, why did they jump to attention when I walked in the room? I'm just, you know, just a regular guy. They said, Brad, in Russia, if you own the business, you're in bed with mafia. If they don't stand up <laughs> and pay attention, he, he goes, they will kill your family and your dog. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, that, that's kind of a hefty price uh, tone of business, you know, in Russia at that time. So I was laughing. Sorry, I got sidetracked. No, I, I that's, just... that's, a, that's a good story. Yeah. Uh, that was funny. Hey, uh, I want everybody to know we're uh, two Pennsylvania boys here, so we know what Scrapple tastes like, uh, <laughs> and we know. And we drink pop. You got it. It's pop. Sorry. And we eat hoagies, not submarines. <laughs> so um, tell everybody, where you, you grew up where in Pennsylvania? A small city outside of Pittsburgh, a suburb of sort of Pittsburgh called McKeesport. Yeah. Uh, which today I understand is considered one of the most dangerous small towns in the country. But uh, <laughs> when I grew up, it was a working steel mill town, which was yeah a good place to grow up. Absolutely. The, the mills have closed and things are different. Yeah. Well, I grew up in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. Lebanon, that's how we say it. And uh, we had the, the steel mill, Bethlehem Steel, and we had the Lebanon Steel Foundry. And I remember... In the late seventies, I had friends dropping out of high school uh, to go get jobs over there because they were paying, I think, like fifteen dollars an hour, which is unheard of in uh, yeah. nineteen seventy-seven. And uh, they were giving that out benefits, huge. yeah. And then in, I think it was two or three years later, um, they laid everybody off and closed both those those mills. And my best friend's father, he was the the visiting physician that would go over and fill out the insurance forms and check people's blood pressure and, you know, get them on prescription meds, whatever they needed or surgery, whatever. And, um, he, his hours kept getting cut, kept getting cut. And finally it just, it became a ghost town and my hometown, um, kind of died a little bit and they didn't have a way for people to go to the next level. Like they didn't offer any kind of public service to teach computers because computers were beginning to come into fashion at that time. So by 80, 84 or so, 85, people were completely out of work. I think 30% of the population lost employment, which means 60% of the rest of the, the trickle-down theories uh, of economics, meaning people spend money at the local pub, uh, you know, grocery stores, and all the little mom-and-pop shops, those died off. And so I, I definitely understand that you know, this computer revolution not only revolutionized the world, it revolutionized and changed economic dominance. Um, our little hometowns that we grew up in, in everything shifted and changed. And kind of this is the over arc, uh, arcing uh, story of what we're talking about, how this huge shift took place. Um, I don't think anybody could have predicted Napster. I don't think anybody could have predicted Apple's dominance in a niche part of the business. Mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe you predicted it because that's what you do. Uh, but um, you know, am I am I am I on track with this? I don't think a lot of people T totally uh, one hundred percent. It's an amazing uh, world the way it's changed. Technology has has speeded up change at a, a, at a rapid progress, and internet has changed our world. It totally has. My biggest fear is that certain things will be lost to history. Like they won't even show up in the history books. Like my father owned a Studebaker and it was one of the greatest cars, you know, car companies ever. And they came out with the Lark, which was the first economy car in the seventies and everybody laughed at them. And that I was know their, it well. Yeah. That, that was the big hurrah and they went out of business. And so you, you, if I mention Studebaker, most people don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, Certain things will my, just my, be my lost. neighbor. My neighbor right now is named Mike Studebaker from the Studebaker <laughs> family, and he tells me stories. 
Well, if you tell him, you know, my dad owned a 1951 bullet nose four door uh, Studebaker, uh, the one that looked like the airplane taking off. And the four door was not common. It was, it was, you know, if you had a four door, that was rare. And my father kept struggling to find parts for this darn thing. And one day uh, he's at a, a stop sign and a Honda Civic, you know, back in the 70s, Honda Civics, you know, came in uh, off the boat and everybody was buying them because they were cheap. Well, they weren't made very well, you know, physically. And this this car slides through the, a, a, a stop sign and slams into my dad's car. The, the Honda Civic is totaled, like it is crushed like an accordion. And the Studebaker, all my dad had was the bumper was broken, which was solid chrome steel. And my dad was furious because now they had to cut the bumper, find another half bumper and put it together. And so that was all they could find. So he was running out of parts and he had dropped a new engine in, into it. Um, and uh, let me tell you, they were one of the greatest car companies ever. And um, I doubt if anybody's going to remember them. Uh, you know, you and I might be a rare few that I remember still- them very well. I yeah, really, I like the Hawk too. They made a Hawk, was it? Yeah, I like the what was it, the Lancer or the 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 sports car? They made a Lancer. Yeah, the the um, oh, what was it? what was the sports car? Was it, was it the Lancer? Was that the name of the sports car? It had gold I'm wings. Not sure. I, yeah. I I can remember it. I <laughs> well, my dad was going to give me the that Studebaker, but he wound up selling it. So that was around seventy eight. 79 before i really started driving so um this is exciting hey how does how does one get a hold of you who do where do we go who do we reach out to where do we watch your stuff well my uh email to get a hold of me is my name it's nathan period shulhawk at gmail.com and if you just google my name a lot uh a lot of my stuff comes on if you google my name or write me an email I have a uh, database of uh, my newsletter that I send out periodically of cool products that I review. And I don't do paid for reviews. I look for products that I like. I contact a company and I do do reviews for them. Uh, I found some really innovative new products that I really, really like in different categories. And uh I put out reviews and, and I send out some of the latest technologies and things on my newsletter. So somebody drops me a line at again, Nathan period Shulhoff at gmail.com. Uh, I'll put you on my newsletter list. There's no charge. It, it's a free newsletter. Thank you, Nathan. I appreciate that. Hey, everybody reach out to Nathan, please. And we're now going into the lightning round. Nathan, if you have time, I'm going to ask you three questions so we get to know you better. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> okay. You were talking about passion in one of your keynotes. And I want to ask you, other than all the other stuff we know about you, what are you passionate about that maybe no one knows about? I'm passionate. Well, I'm passionate about flying airplanes. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm passionate about what I'm doing. Uh, you know, a lot of times people hate their work. They look forward to Fridays. All my life, I used to look look forward to Mondays, uh, not Fridays. Uh, I love my work. And I've been fortunate that I get to do things, that I have a vision, and I go out and do it. I've had ideas. Uh, When I thought of the MP3 player, I woke up in the middle of the night thinking about the MP3 player and what it would be. And I didn't want to forget about it when I woke up. So I stayed up and I wrote everything down. And that was how I thought about the MP3 player. And it really came from that company that try before you buy company with the software test drive. I thought if you can try software and have all the software on a CD, why do people have to buy a whole album? If they like one song, you should not be able to create playlists. You should I, and I saw with the computer, I you always knew that s- data speed and storage and the the lower cost of ROM, uh, of data storage, yeah. is, is going to change our world. 
And I thought, well, if you could do this with software, why can't we do it with music? And, wow. you know, after we did the listen up player, uh, I thought, you know, I don't want to manufacture MP3 players. I don't want to be in the hardware business where this is going to be. I saw the vision that this will be embedded in other devices like phones, like yeah. music players. You know, I saw that vision right away. Uh, and that actually what made me quit making MP3 players because it was much better just to license and you don't have to build anything because with hardware, you pay for any mistakes that you make Yeah, deep, deeply. Yeah. That's amazing. You know, I, I look back and I remember designing a graphical user interface that had a panel at the bottom of the screen and everything was icons. And uh, my business partners shot that down. They said it was a dumb idea. Now that's your dock, you know, at the bottom of your screen that you have access to. I think you take action on things. That's the that's the difference. And waking up in the middle of the night after a dream or getting inspired, I think that's the way a lot of great ideas have come to fruition. Uh, would you agree on that? Totally. Uh, yeah. it, it, totally. You know, I'm passionate about energy. Uh, and energy is going to change more and more so. I'm a big believer yeah. in green energy, in solar power. Do you know that most people don't realize that the sun puts enough energy on our planet in one day to power the whole planet for one year? Yeah. We just don't know how to harvest it. It's not that it's not there. It's harvesting it. You know, when I started in the solar industry, solar power was only about 12% efficient from the panels. Today, yeah. it's about 18 to 23. Uh, wow. It's got a long way to go, but. It's going to get there. And the price of solar has come down more and more. Today, you can have a solar system with a, and I'm not in the solar business anymore, but you can have it pay back in five to seven years. And then you're yeah. running on free energy. That's amazing. You're not going to believe this, but in junior high, I did a paper and a presentation on how solar panels work. <laughs> back in like 75, 76 and around there. And, uh, you know, I, I explained how putting these three plates together generated ener energy when the sun struck it and then uh, talked about how they heat up, you know, copper, mm -hmm. uh, you know, heat up water and things like that. Um, my problem sometimes is when the um, these local electric companies offer, you know, free installation and in places like California, but they find out they're still very much so hooked up to the grid and relying on the grid instead of the solar panels as much as they do. So um, I've heard stories about that. Maybe that's a rumor. I don't know. But um, if, if if you live in Vegas, we know the power of the sun because we feel it all the time. Well, so um, when I get a house further out in the mountains, I, I'm definitely putting in solar. So I'll be I, I will call you first to find out who's the best. <laughs> Do you know, in 2000, last time I checked this figure was oh, 2014 or so, that 50% of the world has no power. Wow. Okay, they have no electricity in their homes. You know, I've traveled through Africa and India and Nigeria and countries that are different from countries that we, we live in. Yes. And, you know, I uh, these people go to sleep by candlelight. Mm -hmm. and you know, one thing, most of these people have cell phones. They don't yeah. have power, but they have cell phones. And the way they charge their phone is about once a week, they go to town and there's a guy there with a, with, with a Honda generator. And you leave your phone, you get a ticket. And for a small amount of money, a very small, you come back in a few hours and your phone is charged. Uh, be, because they have cell phones because they by having a phone, they can produce their income. They can almost double it, which is yeah. doubling it is tiny. These yeah. are people with electricity. So I went back and we built a device that would sell for between fourteen and fifteen dollars. That they all have bicycles. You remember when you were a kid, you, you yeah. could power your your headlight on a bicycle. Yeah, I remember that. that. Okay, we built a a cell phone charger 
that could work on that and sell for fourteen dollars because they have no money. Right. And we work with organizations that didn't care about money and got this out in very very high volumes to them. Uh, wow, God just bless to make you, a man. difference in the world. You know, God I'm, bless I'm you, a man. big. Well, thank you, thank you. I. Uh, it's fun to do good things. I agree. I was fascinated with um, Nicholas Negroponte's work. Uh, I included yeah. him in my book uh, with the One Laptop Per Child uh, initiative. I'm familiar with it. And I was really blown away that he got the original OEMs, uh, original um, electronic manufacturers, to lower the price on everything in manufacturing and push the envelope in it with invention to create a laptop that had a self governing um, screen that would adapt to sunlight or nightlight. Um, the screen was a certain size. They put ears on this laptop so it could pick up satellite or Wi-Fi wherever it was, and it had a crank on it so it didn't have to be plugged in at night. And mm -hmm. I've seen video footage and, and pictures of whole families sitting on the front porch in like Tahiti in the mountains uh, watching their grandchild learn mathematics by the glow of this computer at night uh, because it's a self-learning tool as well. So I'm very, um, I'm a big fan of, of what, what you guys are doing. Thank you. You're making the world a better the one place. Laptop, the one laptop per child was, was a great initiative. It was a great program. I'm very familiar with it. Uh, yeah. yeah. Very familiar with it. And Dean came in um, his external combustion engine, also called the Sterling engine, uh, he was putting that in Africa, and just by using it as a generator, it actually purifies water as well because it can run on anything. Um, so I found that fascinating too. So you guys, you innovators. Um, my second question, I know we, we went off on a little tangent there. My second question is, can you predict the next big idea for us? Well, if I had the next idea right now, I'd probably be doing it. <laughs> uh, rather than sitting on the beach like I do normally. Uh, but, you know, I think it's going to be an energy. You know, uh, I also believe, uh, you know, people say gasoline cars will always be dominant. I totally right. disagree with that. It's going to be electric cars. It's not going to happen this year or next. And people say, well, the grid can't handle it. No, the grid can't, can't handle it today. But, you know, Companies invest in technologies that where they're going to make money back. That's yeah. just how capitalism works. Right. And as the electric market grows, our grid, which is long overdue for rebuilding, will be rebuilt so they can handle it. And gasoline companies most likely will be involved. But I think fuel and electricity will be huge in the future. It will yeah. open up whole new worlds for us. Uh, I also think it has a long way to go, probably because of politics, or, uh, but alternative green energy will be huge. Maybe further along than electric cars, but electric cars will boost it. Yeah. Uh, well, the original cars were electric, you know, back in the 1800s, late 1800s. And so we're just perfecting the next generation of electric cars, finally. And I do believe that in the future, the electrical grid will be upgraded so it can handle all this. Um, and I do look forward to that. Uh, I also believe, you know, like companies like Bloom Energy, they were featured on 60 Minutes years ago. Um, I don't know what happened to them. And they were about providing a fuel cell for your home instead of having mm -hmm. this huge HVC, HVAC hooked up. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So they 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 made a joke on sixty minutes. Like one of these power packs will um, uh, be able to provide energy for a Japanese home, but an American home it's like four. <laughs> so it's like oh boy, we, we we're getting a bad rap already. Um, but it it was one of these um, technologies where I looked at it and I said to myself, you know, we really should be more in the twenty first century. We should be building. Uh, you know, houses, uh, they have computers that can now build your house. You know, it's a, it's, it just pours concrete. 
And then uh, we use hemp as a as a building block to create a, a super strong but light concrete for your home. Um, and and all these things, I feel these industries are resisting hard on these new innovations. And if we are truly going to talk about going green, and if we're truly going to talk about climate change, we got to get these corporations pressured to kind of go to the next level, especially with building homes, because that's for a lot of people, that's their primary investment, number one. Yep. And number two, how do we provide homes for people when a lot of our homes, the new buying stuff, I love it, but we have a lot of homes that are dilapidated and falling down or are, are okay to live in and just need to be fixed up. Um, we have a hell of a future ahead of us, and, uh, and I hope we get there sooner than later. Let's put it that way. We will, but it'll take time. And uh, everything is product, product and acceptance uh, driven. You know, yeah. I think I think mm-hmm. another big futuristic part is artificial intelligence. Uh, oh yeah, I, I think more and more products that start utilizing AI will have a big uh, futuristic advantage. Yeah, they'll do things better, quicker. And smarter, uh, and I don't think the public realizes how much AI is actually utilized today in pharmaceutical trials, oh, yeah. in other areas like uh, McDonald's. All your fast food uses it for buying cups, right? Uh, quantities of cups to buy. Uh, uh, car rental places use it uh, to make things more efficient in multi locations. Yeah. Well, a lot of people don't realize this. I, I wrote about this in my first book, Liquid Leadership. Uh, I went to the Games and Learning Conference out in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. And one of the big talks that everybody was abuzz about was with Professor James Paul G. Uh, he was going to sit down with the video games critic from the New York Times uh, to discuss his book, Video Games, What They Teach Us About Learning and Literacy. And it was just fascinating to me to see the this generational divide that was taking place uh, because some people laughed at what some young people were talking about. And I feel like the youth of today, they've been trained to embrace this new technology. Would you say they're, they're easier to embrace? Whereas my generation, and I may be less uh, a part of this mindset, but we've been taught to resist technology a little bit. Yes, but hasn't that always been the case? Uh, yeah, even, probably. <laughs> think back when we were maybe a bit younger and the technology age was new. Uh, older people would say, I don't use these newfangled computers. It was, <laughs> it was youth-driven. Yeah. Like Wozniak and Steve Jobs, they were, they were barely, they were teenagers, okay, when yeah. they started this. Uh, you ever see the early pictures of Bill Gates? He looks like. He looks like he's 13 years old when he's oh, he a little older. But, you know, I, I think uh, yeah. something about youth, they're not afraid. Right. They, they you know, they're, they haven't been driven by past lives. Right. Well, I think Aristotle said it best, and I'm paraphrasing once again. Uh, but he said, uh, the youth of today are chatty. They don't want to work out, you know, and, uh, you know, they talk back to the, to the elders, you know, the, the, the children are tyrants in their own households. And that was Aristotle said that, you know, those darn kids and their stone tablets and, you know, pens. So I, I think you're correct. It, it is an ongoing battle. Um, but uh, and it's going to be there all the time. It's not a battle. It's just the next generation is using new technology and they're trained differently, as I point out with these devices. but. Um, my third and final question I want to ask you is, is there anything we should be scared about when it comes to the future? Artificial intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but, but, but not so much scared where you pretend it's not there and don't use it. I can remember when the Internet first came, people kept saying, oh, there's going to be so much fraud. Uh, stores will no longer exist. And, you know, I used to say back then, stores will still exist. 
They're going to have to become more innovative and better, or they're going to go away. Uh, but they'll still exist. And right. yes, there was more crime. There will always be crime. It's just another way to rob a bank. You right. have to have laws and rules, and uh, we have to be on our toes. And that'll be the same way with artificial intelligence. Yeah, it's going to be a little harder to catch somebody. Uh, and somebody may call up using your voice, and you have to convince your wife, it really wasn't me, dear. <laughs> uh, uh mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't think you can not turn around and look away and pretend that it doesn't exist. These are tools of the future. Uh, I agree. I agree. I 100% agree. So what you're saying is throw out your computers, right? <laughs> no, no, I, 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 I'm not. It's, you know, upgrade them. <laughs> yes, I agree. Um, I may use uh, AI to write my next book. Because I, I want to run an experiment because I want to write a book for entrepreneurs and and talk about embracing the next you know level of, of technology. Because uh, when I was in college for art and design, the first thing they taught us was the Bauhaus rules from Germany. And that's where they brought together all the best architects and graphic designers and everybody. And they came up with a set of rules that everybody could agree upon. And one of the very first rules... Uh, you know, besides form follows function, was um, you must embrace the tools of the era. And so at one point, that was the airbrush. And at another point, that was a T-square and a light box. And then at one point, it was the Mac 2 CI, you know, and then at one point, it's now, you know, if you saw my setup, if I turned the camera around, you'd be laughing. I have two giant screen panels and two computers and then another panel and I'm also working on a PC because I started doing game design, character design in a 3D gaming world that is using voxel technology. And I'm just sitting here having a blast creating these characters. I'll send you some privately. Um, you'll laugh, but as a graphic designer, I always think in the 3D world. I couldn't have dreamed of this setup 30 years ago. Couldn't have ever imagined this. And now... Here I am sitting in Command Central at Shea Zalas here um, and being mesmerized with the future. And I want to thank you uh, for being a part of that future. You created some of the stuff I'm using right now. So thank you. I want to thank the world for allowing me to be. Uh, you know, it'll only get better. Uh, the tools of the future will make these old tools obsolete. You know, you yeah. mentioned to me about the youth. Uh, and how accepting they are. You know, I, I love to do keynote speeches, and uh, my some of my favorite places are, are universities. I'm doing one yeah. in in uh, Orange County at Chapman University next month on October 27th, and may be open to the public. Uh, mm -hmm. And because the questions they ask in in the Q and A period, we get some interaction which just fascinates me and. Uh, I usually learn as much from them as I like to think that they've learned from me. I agree. I agree. And I, I've noticed that youth today will sit forward when they hear your resume a little bit more than, say, other uh, you know, people who are of a certain age. And I feel incredibly proud of my resume, as I'm sure you are, because it allows you to help mentor this next generation, um, this new generation that really needs guidance. They have, they have so many amazing tools. You know, it's like handing a Corvette, 1958 Corvette to a 17 year old. It's like, why would you do that? It's like, that's what they're handling. So someone really has to teach them how to drive at 70 miles an hour. Uh, and if, it, and they don't think they need guidance, uh, but we all did at that age. We all did. So. Oh, I still do. You know, <laughs> at, at the end of the day, we're all renters. It is so true. <laughs> you said a mouthful, my friend. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, please, please reach out to Nathan. He's been an amazing guest today. Thank you, uh, Nathan. How do we get a hold of you again? We go to nathan.shulhoff at gmail.com. Right. Nathan period Shulhoff. That's N-A-T-H-A-N period 
S-C-H-U-L-H-O-F, as in Frank, at gmail.com. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, reach out uh, to Nathan, please. And don't forget, next week, we're going to have another extraordinary guest here on Awakened Nation. Nathan, thank you once again for being on the show. I appreciate it, my friend. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for being a big part of the Awakened Nation movement. This is how you can help me and our extraordinary guests. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please share it out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And let's grow this movement by word of mouth. Our success will be because of you. Thank you, and see you next week.